Hello and welcome back to Great British Biking Adventures. This is episode 15 of our coast adventure in which we are attempting to ride around the British coastline. We've completed the southwest leg of the adventure and if you look at a map you'll see it sort of looks like a leg. In the last episode we returned to cover Southampton because we had bypassed it when we went to the Isle of Wight. We hadn't fully appreciated how important Southampton is to the maritime history of Great Britain. In particular, the part it played during the Second World War and D-Day. You rejoin us now where we left off in episode 13. You may remember we started the day with a glorious sunrise camped on top of a cliff overlooking the sea on the Isle of Wight before we had a quick look around the island. You join us as we take the ferry back to the mainland from Fishbourne to Portsmouth. Portsmouth is one of Britain's most historic cities and one of the world's best known ports. It's the only English city not on the mainland of Great Britain. It might not look like it, but it's actually on an island, Portsy Island. It is the UK's most densely populated city. Its history can be traced to Roman times and has been a significant Royal Navy dockyard and base for centuries. In 1545, French invaders were repelled at the Battle of the Solent, during which the flagship Mary Rose was sunk witnessed by King Henry VIII himself from South Sea Castle on the tip of Portsea Island. Portsmouth has the world's oldest dry dock. The world's first mass production line was established here by Mark Isambard Brunel, the father of the engineering genius Isambard Kingdom Brunel, at the naval base's block mills, which produced pulley blocks for the Royal Navy fleet. In 1805, Admiral Nelson left Portsmouth to command the fleet which defeated France and Spain at the Battle of Trafalgar. The Royal Navy's reliance on Portsmouth led to it becoming the most fortified city in the world and, at the height of the British Empire throughout Pax Britannica, was considered the world's greatest naval port. By the 19th century, Portsmouth was surrounded by a ring of defensive land and sea forts known as the Palmerston Forts, which we spoke about in the last episode. This was in anticipation of an invasion from the French that never came. During the Second World War, the city was a pivotal embarkation point for the D-Day landings and was bombed extensively in the Portsmouth Blitz, which resulted in the deaths of 930 people. The D-Day Story Exhibition at South Sea is well worth a visit. Southwark House, just north of the city, was the headquarters of the Supreme Allied Commander, Dwight D. Eisenhower. In 1982, a large Royal Navy task force departed from Portsmouth for the Falklands War. Her Majesty's Yacht Britannia was formerly based in Portsmouth. The Royal Naval Base here is home to two-thirds of the UK's surface fleet. The base has long been nicknamed Pompey, a nickname that it shares with the wider city of Portsmouth and Portsmouth Football Club. The naval base also contains the National Museum of the Royal Navy and Portsmouth Historic Dockyard, which has a collection of historic warships, including the Mary Rose I spoke about earlier, Lord Nelson's flagship HMS Victory, the world's oldest naval ship still in commission, and HMS Warrior, the Royal Navy's first ironclad warship. The waterfront and Portsmouth Harbour are dominated by the Spinnaker Tower, one of the United Kingdom's tallest structures at 560 feet. South Sea is Portsmouth's seaside resort, which was named after South Sea Castle. South Sea has two piers, Clarence Pier Amusement Park and South Parade Pier. The world's only regular hovercraft service operates from South Sea Hoverport to Ride on the Isle of Wight. Portsmouth is the birthplace of notable people such as author Charles Dickens, engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel, former Prime Minister James Callaghan, actor Peter Sellers and author-journalist Christopher Hitchens. This is what's known as a pillbox, officially known as British hardened field defences of World War II. 28,000 of them were built during the war all over Britain, not just near the coast. They were used in the event of a German invasion for which there were plans called Operation Sea Lion. There were numerous designs and adaptations. 
6,500 remain. During this adventure, we've seen loads. If you keep a keen eye, there's at least one other in this episode. Here we are at Hailing Island, at the end opposite Portsmouth. Um, that's the water between Portsmouth and Hailing Island. Absolutely stunning. We're obviously looking out onto the English Channel. That's um, Isle of Wight there. And that is the beautiful English Channel. So Portsmouth in that direction. Um, obviously Bognor Regis, Brighton in that direction. This is the causeway from Hanging Island back to the mainland. So we've just entered West Wittering Estate. Absolutely gorgeous. Lovely traditional red brick and pebble fronts of houses. Really pretty. Elvis, King of Rock and Roll. It's a funny little place. Sort of quite cute, really. And there's a co op over there in an old pub. Open all year round. Yeah, so we're just leaving Pagham. It's, what time is it? It's 20 past four, so we're on our way to find some camping. And we're heading uh, the other side of Bognor Regis to a place called Cuckoo Camping, where hopefully we can find a nice pitch. I think we're in the end of Bognor. Bognor Regis south coast of England and the tide is in well and truly I would say Shingley Beach beautiful
Bognor Regis is probably best known for its Butlins holiday camp. In the 1930s, Billy Butlin started his entertainment and holiday empire by opening amusement parks. One of the first was at Bognor Regis. These are seen as tacky and old fashioned now, but were the place to be back then, where you could apparently rub shoulders with the elites. In 1960, Billy Butlin opened the holiday camp. The 50s, 60s and 70s were the heyday for this type of holiday, before people started going abroad and later wanting less packaged holidays and more independence. The formula was simple. Butlins provided everything from the moment the campers arrived to the time they left. This included basic chalet accommodation, meals, things to do from swimming to snooker, organised games for both children and adults and most importantly nighttime entertainment from cabaret to comedy. These places are the source of many happy memories for children and adults alike. There must be thousands of family photo albums crammed with those memories waiting to be rediscovered by future generations. Butlins has weathered the storms by reducing the number of camps to just three. The original at Skegness, Minehead and this one here at Bognor. Butlins of Bognor Regis. Oh, is it Butlins? Yeah, Butlins. And there's the chalets. <laughs> And we're trying to locate the Cuckoo Camp Caravan and, ca and tent site. Here we go, Cuckoo Camp. We've had to come through like a farm and horses and things. We're not quite sure what this is going to be like. It's described as wild camping. Maybe it just means they don't mow the grass. We don't know. <laughs> it looks fun. A bit different from last night. Magpie, cuckoo. There's your toilet, hopefully. No, so maybe they come round. But there was a few other fields, it's not just this one, so we'll keep going. So what about up ahead? In that sunny spot? All back out again. Yeah. Cuckoo campsite just past Bognor Regis. It's about eight o'clock in the evening and Jared's very proud of the fact that he's got a lovely fire going. Other people have a fire. But ours is the best. They've all gone they've all gone out. But Jared found a really massive log over in the hedgerow and bunged that on as well. Consequently, we have a good fire. And there's our transport and our bed for the night. And it feels like it's zero degrees already. It is cold. It's very, very cold. So it's going to get a lot colder than this. Oh golly, it's going to be a cold morning. Join us next Friday to find out just how cold it got 
Thanks for watching. We hope you're enjoying our coast adventure. If this is your first time here and you like what you see, then it's not too late to catch up with the previous episodes before next Friday. And don't forget to like, subscribe and leave a comment.